This morning, um, as I was listening to Proverbs uh, chapter 23, because today's the 23rd, and I like to do that every day. Sometimes I read it, but most of the time I just listen to it. But as I was listening to it this morning, I was struck with, um, with verses 9 and 10. And verse 9 says, Do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the good sense of your words. Do not move an ancient landmark or enter the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is strong, and he will plead their cause against you. Apply your heart to instruction and your ear to the words of knowledge. And I guess it struck me because of teaching in here today and bringing some, um, some passages from the Word of God that speak to us very directly as women, but that even sometimes I'm like, I don't really want to teach this. But um, it's what the Word of God says, and especially as you look around in terms of where our culture is, is it is so needed. So this series, of course, as you know, is called Growing Girls. And let me go ahead and say to those of you who will um, be leading the small groups, there will be note cards just like last semester. If you have a question or something that you want me to address on the radio program tomorrow, write it down, and then your group leader, your Titus mom, will turn those in, and then I will have them tomorrow. I'll be on live, um, the radio, and that's WAGP. Um, FM and you can tune in and if you're not local you can listen to that live as well you can stream it but growing girls into the title of today's message is is the future female and then I kind of added my own little thing should it be um, former Secretary of State and presidential candidate Hillary Clinton once said and by the way this is just kind of the introduction what I'm going to talk about right now she once said, despite all the challenges we face, I remain convinced that, yes, the future is female. And, of course, we ask the question, is she correct? And what does that phrase even mean? Is the future female? Should it be? What does God say about the future being female? Is he silent or has he spoken? And does his word or Ms. Clinton's word shape our views? We see her phrase permeating our culture. We now see the phrase emblazoned everywhere and it's making its way into our hearts and into the hearts of our girls. We, however, must know the truth and we must teach and model the truth before our girls. Our girls are growing. Girls around you are growing. They are growing and they are learning and they are teachable and we must help them. But you know what? Women are ruling. <laughs> It's like, it's not the future is female, it's like now is female in terms of what our culture is like. And as we get started this morning, I want to share some opening thoughts. When women rule in a way that is inconsistent with God's created role for them, we experience horrible consequences. Women, and here's some of them, women not only leave the home, but there becomes a disdain for a woman in the home who chooses to be there, who wants to be there. And, of course, we know that that's the very place God has designed for sons and daughters to be equipped for life. That's where they are to be trained and brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And, of course, when women leave this crucial role and this place of service, there, there ends up being no godly women to nurture our young boys and there are no godly women to teach our young girls in the most teachable and moldable times of their lives. And of course, this creates a huge vacuum. It creates a hole in God's plan. And if, because if I, as a woman, am not at my post doing what God has called me to do, who is going to be there? Who's going to keep it? Who's going to fill that hole? Well, God knows that the best game plan for getting the job done right, he has laid it out in his word. And I think about this, God chose a stable, no pun intended, a stable home for his own son to come into this world. There were things that even Jesus learned. Hebrews tells us that he learned obedience at home. Imagine if Mary had abandoned her home Leaving the home, too, results in mass abandonment of children. And it's not so much we think of it, oh, abandonment, that just means like leaving your child on the side of the road. No, we're talking about um, abandon, I'm talking about abandon, abandonment emotionally and in every way how much they need their moms, but it results in 
mass abandonment. It results in neglect. It results in abuse. And then, of course, horror of horrors, it results in murder. And think about that. Murder. And abortion being the greatest acceptable murder of all time. And who's getting the abortions? Women. Why? Because children are viewed. Why does this happen? All of these things. Because children have become to be viewed as a hindrance, an obstacle, an impediment, an encumbrance, a barrier, a difficulty, and an interference to real life and what women are truly capable of. And, of course, we know when we view children this way, the natural result is that we abandon them. It doesn't matter who raises them. It's the natural result is to abuse them. And when I say abuse, I mean in a myriad of ways. To neglect them, not give them the attention and the training that they need. And, of course, as I've already said, even to see them as a big hindrance. And so women have been sold a bill of goods by our culture that, the, that we can just get them out of the way. If a pregnancy has resulted, we can just get that out of the way through what we call abortion. And let's face it, even among God's women, children are viewed in this way. We hope they aren't. But they are. Sometimes it's not even that women realize they're viewing their children in general this way. And, and even for me, you know, I felt the message all of my ministry lives, life, along with my husband. You can't have a real ministry unless your children are out of the way. But God's ways are different. So if you have children, they are not in the way of a ministry, your ministry. They are your ministry. But we're not seeing that on a broad scale in women's ministry, even among conservative, so-called conservative evangelical women. But they are the ministry. What we do with them becomes the platform for extension beyond the home into the church and into the lives of other women. And now with women gone from the home, someone has to care for children, so we get people who have no vested interest in these children. Many driven by money. Some of them just making money off the children. <laughs> Do you realize that there was a time in this country when couples could not adopt children if the mother worked outside the home? The children were viewed as an inheritance. They were worth a mom's time to raise. When women rule in a way that's inconsistent with God's design, it is an, an indictment against the sorry leadership of men. And yes, it is true that many men are sorry leaders. Some exercise leadership like a tyrant. It's a head trip for them. They distort God's word and, be, and they become domineering, power hungry, and I'll assert my authority or else. Some of them are abrasive, pushing women around and putting women down. And this, in part, helps to incite the rebellion of women. But we really don't need any help to rebel. Some men exercise no leadership. Many men being passive and wimpy, laying around, not just letting the women do what they want to do. In the New Testament, y'all, Jesus appointed men for leadership. The 70, the 12 apostles, and establishing the church, men were appointed to be the elders and the ruling and, and to rule. Women didn't have to be appointed to office because of our nature. We, for the most part, don't need to be told what to do. We are, by nature, servants. We fill places that need to be filled. And when a woman is a true servant, she doesn't need to have a big office or to be recognized. God knows what she is doing, and she finds reward and contentment in that. But now women in the church are not satisfied. And y'all, over the years, I have received brochure after brochure in the mail inviting me to women's events. Years ago, I received this one, and I've saved it all these years. I received this one. I, I know you can... I'll open it up a little bit. You can see all of this. But it was called the Global Celebration for Women. And, of course, I looked over the brochure, and I really was saddened. Because here's what it's about. Exalting women, calling attention to women, celebrating women. And you remember that phrase that used to go around, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it? I mean, what kind of nonsense is that? 
And I looked over the brochure, and please understand, I'm all about women's conferences <laughs> if they focus on God's design for women as outlined in Scripture. But at this particular conference, there was not one workshop, not one main session devoted to biblical mothering, grandmothering, being a biblical wife, how to use the years of being a single woman and helping and equipping single women and, and how God uses them. But why not? Because here's the thing, y'all, across the globe, across the world, most women are mothers and wives. Most are. And if this is a global celebration for women, or if that's what it was, why shouldn't they teach on that role that God has not only given to most women, but also that most women have accepted? Instead, it was all about celebrating us, y'all, what God's done for us, rejoicing in our contributions to the kingdom building. And I remember thinking, well, maybe they're going to hit it there because, you know, this is kingdom work. Motivating and valuing women in their giftedness, exciting women for evangelism, and equipping women to touch the world. Workshops included, all kinds of stuff. And then, of course, they said, and with a special Bible te teacher, and you can even fill in the blank, of, and you know who that was. And by the way, that particular women's Bible teacher has, in my opinion, brought so much harm to the biblical role of women and so much harm to the lack of discernment among God's women. And now after years of her teaching, we have so many copycat women out there and in case I thought this conference was just for women, no, they offered a special men's luncheon too. So I guess if I'd gone, I could have taken Carl. And here's the write-up for the men. Gentlemen, start your spiritual engines and be prepared to get revved up over what God is doing as you encounter brothers in Christ from nations around the world. You'll gather around the lunch table, the fellowship, network, meet, greet, swap news and views. Swap news and views about whatever is on your mind and in your heart. Make a date for Thursday. So while the women are empowering women, I don't know what's going on with the men. And please understand, y'all, please understand my heart. When I talk about some of the women that I probably will in this series call by name, it's not an indictment against them personally. Please understand that. It's not a thing. It's just because of where we are as a nation. It's because of where we are as women in the church. And what's happening in our homes. Something's wrong here. God has not called us as women to make ourselves known. To celebrate and worship ourselves. He has called us to make him known. To celebrate him and worship him and obey him and to put our lives in line with his word. That's how we bring glory to him is by obeying what we know, obeying what his word says. Can you even imagine a conference for men called a global celebration for men? Now, have I totally offended you? It's because here's the thing, y'all, if you're offended now... We've just begun. <laughs> Father, I thank you for our time together. I thank you for the women that you've brought into this room who will hopefully be here during the duration of today's message. Father, I am so aware of how little I know. But I'm so aware of what your word teaches. And Father, I just want to be a messenger, a messenger, a woman messenger speaking to women and helping them and helping myself understand what you have said in your word. And in this day when all we want to hear are messages that make us feel good and tell us we're okay. I pray that you would open our eyes, as the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 18, open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things from your word, from your law. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truths it contains. I thank you for this trek that we're going to be making. And Father, 
I don't know how far we'll get today. You know, as I've prepared, I've just asked you to help me and know when to stop. I'll stop when our time is up, and then we'll pick it up next time. But, Father, I ask for your kindness. I ask for your grace. I, Father, I pray that you would help me not mess up your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all, I love our country. Yet when I look around, if I'm honest, sometimes I'm very sad at the nation we've become. Because we are living in days of rampant perversion and immorality. Just like the days of the judges when everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And the saddest thing of all is, is that the immorality of the people is reflected in its leadership. Nationally in government, personally in our homes, and even in our churches. Yet God still moves. That's the hope of the gospel. That's, a, that, that's the hope of the Lord. He raises up modern-day prophets to speak truth to God's people. And as they speak truth, God exposes the sin of his people. Only as they speak truth. <laughs> and it's not pretty. But God does this so that his people will take responsibility for their sins. The modern-day preachers, the modern-day prophets... And the, and, and prophet, the modern-day prophets are those who are forth-telling the Word of God. They don't have extra revelation. They're not telling you something that's not already in Scripture. They're forth-telling the truth of God's Word, these modern-day prophets. But they urge God's people to listen, to turn from their wicked ways so that God can heal them instead of bringing judgment. But so often, God's people don't want to hear anything but pretty things. Isn't that where we are in the evangelical church today? We only want to hear pretty things. We only want to hear things that uh, make, yeah, pat us on the back and tell us we're good. In our nation, y'all, we're in the midst of an incredible moral storm. And the consequences of our sin is catching, uh, they're catching up with us. So many people don't see it, even in the church, but some do. In fact, that's the context of what uh, God said to Habakkuk. Remember the prophet Habakkuk? Carl has preached that book here. And the prophet had been looking around at his world and at God's people, and he wondered, why is there so much oppression? Why is there so much injustice? Why do evil men prosper? Why do the righteous suffer? Why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't God clean up this mess? Why, why, why? Of course, if you know the Old Testament all, at all, you know that the Old Testament reveals a pattern. God shows us many times in Scripture God's desire to bless his people, God's people sin, God then exposes the sin of the people, God brings increased judgment on his people, God offering restoration, and then the people crying out and being, being restored, and then they repeat the pattern all over again. And you see it from Genesis to Revelation. This is the pattern. God, again, God's longing to bless his people. God's people turning away in disobedience. God exposing the sin of his people and God bringing judgment. And then God's prom promises of restoration. Ever since the beginning, for every generation, the judgment God uh, first brought upon mankind through the curse. Remember in Genesis chapter 3? Sir, it serves as a constant reminder that we need something. We need someone outside of ourselves. And, of course, that someone is God himself. The judgment of the curse is a picture, though, of God's grace, that the struggles we face are allowed by God to bring us to God. And if you study the Bible seriously, you see the pattern emerge over and over in Scripture. God blesses, people sin, God exposes, God brings judgment, God restores. When we repent, it's almost as if we can't be trusted with the blessings of God. To Ezekiel, God said this, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. I mean, think about that. Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. I mean, and that's what pastors are supposed to do today. Make known to the church her abominations. To Isaiah, uh, he said this in chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Go and tell this people. So today, in the next three sessions, I will tell you as a woman talking to other women based on the command in Titus chapter 2, older women teach and encourage the young women. Y'all, what we're going to cover in our four weeks of Growing Girls is so incredibly important. And I want you to know right away, as I've already said, that a lot of the content is not pretty. And it will be difficult to hear. It will be difficult for me to say it and even to read it from Scripture. 
But here I am and here you are. Paul said this when he wrote the believers in Corinth and his words so express how I feel. He says, and when I came to you, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Now, when God told Isaiah, go and tell this people, he also told Isaiah that the people would not respond. I mean, can you imagine? He says, go and tell them, this is your job, this is what I want you to do. You'll be obeying me when you do this, but you know what? They're not going to listen to you. This is, listen to what else he said. Keep on listening, but they don't perceive. Keep on looking, don't, but, they don't, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. God's telling him that the message would not result in too much spiritual response. The people had not listened before, and they wouldn't listen now. In fact, the people on hearing Isaiah's message would become even more hardened against the Lord. Jesus quoted part of this verse to explain that Israel in his day could not believe because they would not believe. Isaiah, of course, had already responded. If you know, he said, here am I, send me. But how long? How long would he have to go on delivering a message of judgment to a people who wouldn't understand? To people who would be insensitive, whose ears would be dull, whose eyes would be dim. Now the Lord told Isaiah that he was just to proclaim the message until forever. (laughs) And for him that was till the Babylonian exile actually occurred and the people were deported from the land. And of course, though Isaiah himself did not live that long, God meant that he should keep on preaching. Just keep on preaching. And the negative response of the people and the terrible results to the nation must have been discouraging to Isaiah. Because Isaiah was just a man. But God is God, and God assured him that there would be a remnant who would listen. God compared that remnant to stumps of oak trees. And from this stump, Or holy seed, a believing remnant would come. Even though the people in Judah would be almost totally wiped out, God promised to preserve a small number of believers in the land. And of course, I as a woman, and in today and the day in which we live, I do believe with my heart that there's a remnant remnant of women today. Although sometimes you look around and you think, what is happening You look around, and I'm not talking about just in the culture out there among unbelievers. I look at the church, and I think, what is happening with God's women? I'm talking about true believers. But I believe there is a a remnant of women today who want to obey God, a remnant whose ears are not dull, whose eyes are, are not dim, who are sensitive to the voice in the heart of God, who won't become more hardened the more truth they hear. A remnant who are not afraid of difficult truth, who will bear up as God exposes our sin, and who will walk with God. A remnant of women who will walk with him and obey what we know and pass it on then to the next generation of girls. Women who will not only be godly women, but will be intentional about growing godly girls. And this isn't just about the mom who has little girls in the home, but although that is paramount. This is about us as women in general. What are we passing on to the next generation as we live our lives? What you do and what you believe matters. Now, it's my heart's desire as we walk through all of this stuff and as God exposes our sins and as we we, um, come face to face with truth from, from his word, that we will see with our eyes, that they w- we will hear with our ears and understand with our hearts and return and be healed because that's the message of redemption. That's the message of redemption. You know, in, in Isaiah chapter 4, which we will get to later on in this series, God says this, and there will be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day and a refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. Don't you want that? So we're today going to focus on Isaiah chapter 3. 
we are going to camp in verses 16 through chapters 4 to 1. Well, I said, yeah, so I said today and next time. By the way, you, you won't finish your handout today, so don't think you're not get, I'm not getting to that last line. We will, we will be, we will, I will stop somewhere, and I, only God knows where I'm stopping. But we'll probably stop somewhere in the middle of uh, under chapter 3. And if you notice on your outline, too, there's more space between chapter 3 and chapter 4. That's by design because there's a lot of stuff you might want to write down. And you might want to turn it over and write on the back. Or you might not. You, just might, you might learn better just by listening. Um, but while we're in these verses in Isaiah, we're going to take a visit to the prophet Ezekiel. He was a later preacher, but his message parallels with the message of Isaiah. But he gives, gives even more sobering details, and you'll see what I mean as we get there. But I do believe, I do believe with all my heart that this is God's message for his women in this day as we are growing the girls around us. And those of you who know me, you know I'm a big picture type of gal. We have to understand, the, and I know for me, if I understand the big picture then it makes sense of the smaller parts. I make sense of the day in and day out of my life. And it's my prayer that, that we will have ears to hear and that we will not be fools who spurn the word of God. So I want to say a couple of things about Isaiah. First, I'm thankful for him. I look forward to meeting him one day in heaven. I'm thankful that he had the courage to speak God's truth to God's people even though they didn't want to hear it. Isaiah was grieved over the state of God's people. He wanted more than anything for the nation to be healed. And I want to remind you, too, that because Isaiah obeyed God, he was martyred by King Manasseh. Hebrews 11, verse 37, tells us that the great men of faith suffered. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskin, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. And then God adds this. Men of whom the world was not worthy. And Isaiah was one of those men. The world was not worthy of him. And of course, too, I'm thankful <clears throat> for his wife. God did give a wife to him to be his helper, completer, and to be the mother of his sons. Isaiah calls her the prophetess. And when Isaiah approached her wanting to obey God and having children, she agreed. God's, God had plans for those boys, and although... We're not going to meet Isaiah's wife. We won't meet her. God shares with us that this great man of God is married. And by his tender words about repentant women, which we will see, I know she had to have been a godly woman who helped him in his ministry. But mostly I'm thankful for his God who is honest with us, who does what is right, whose mercy is everlasting, who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations. So Isaiah, this is kind of a little bit of an overview here, and then I'll give you some things to fill in in those blanks. Isaiah begins with a, with a rebuke and warning of God's judgment. And in your small groups today, you'll see that I have you reading chapters 1 and 2 together because I'm just going to kind of summarize them. But I don't know. You'll probably have so much to talk about in your small groups. You may. I don't know what, what's going to happen in those groups. But it begins with rebuke and warning of God's judgment. Now, have you noticed that people quote from Isaiah all the time? Christians quote from Isaiah all the time. But if you notice, it's usually from the last 26 chapters of Isaiah. Because Isaiah is also filled with comfort and encouragement for God's people. But this is after the stinging words of warning and judgment. These years in, in Israel's history were a time of great struggle politically and spiritually. The northern kingdom of Israel was deteriorating. It was deteriorating in all these realms, militarily too, politically. And it finally fell in 722 B.C. And the southern kingdom of Judah looked as though it was going to collapse as well. But it withstood. And in this political struggle and spiritual decline, God chose Isaiah to rise and deliver a message to the people in Judah. His message was that, they was that they should trust in God, who had promised them a glorious kingdom through Moses and David. Isaiah exposed the sin of God's people. He warned the people of God's judgment. He urged them not to rely on Egypt or any other foreign power to protect them, for the Lord was the only protection they would need. And, of course, you see comfort in Isaiah. It's like dominant in the latter portion of Isaiah. And that's the part of Isaiah that we tend to like the most and like to read the most. And Isaiah's message, however, is applicable for the church today. Now, please understand, Israel was God's chosen people. 
They were singled out by God through Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. And that's when God singled out a people for his own possession through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. God made a covenant with Abraham. And he promised to prosper his people, to bless them, to be with them, and to make them a great nation. But he also said that they must obey him. And throughout the Old Testament, we see God's people living in rebellion, except there are some exceptions. And when God's people don't respond to rebuke and warning God sends through his messengers, he brings judgment. Now, Isaiah was calling the people back. He was calling them back to the covenant that covenantal relationship with God. He was reminding the generation, his generation, of how far they had drifted, of the sinful condition in which they were living, and of its consequences, nationally and personally. God would bring severe judgments on the nation, but he would also eventually restore them to the land with full kingdom blessings because of his promise, because he is faithful. He is a faithful God. And now today, as New Testament believers, we are the church. We are the bride of Christ. But, and we, God has chosen us. We are his royal priesthood. Anyone who has placed his faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ has passed out of judgment into life. We are not as God's people, those who know him. We are not destined for God's eternal wrath. That eternal wrath will come to unbelievers. It's going to happen. But if you know Christ is your Savior, we are not destined for God's eternal wrath, for his eternal judgment. But we can and we will and we do experience his judgment in this life, sometimes personally and as a church. And when we as a people abandon him, we see it. We too experience the consequences of what's happening in our nation, of national judgment, of what's going on. We are all affected by the bad laws that are passed. We're all affected when justice is not carried out the way it should be. I mean, we're all affected. We're affected. And we, our hearts are cry within us when we see wickedness prevail. We're saddened by what happens in this nation. If we belong to Christ, we have God's heart. And the things that he grieves over, we grieve over because we belong to him. And God shows and tells us all throughout his word the signs of his judgment. And in fact, Israel experienced a series of these. And sometimes each one was more severe than the one right before it. And does that make God mean? No. Does he love to see his children get the consequences of their sin? No. His heart is grieved. I mean, you know, if you're just a a mom, do you enjoy bringing judgment on your children? Do you enjoy having to discipline them? Do you enjoy that? When they grieve your heart, when they deliberately disobey you, when they go their own way and you know you have to bring them back, do you enjoy that? No, you do it because you, you care for their, their holiness. You want they, them to, their lives to yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness, as Hebrews tells us, when he's talking about how God disciplines his own children. You know, we, we, we don't want to see our children in pain even when, when they're getting the just consequences of their sin. We're grieved by that. But discipline is for their good, our children's good, and it's for our good. As moms, we hate to do it. I hated to do it. But sometimes because of their continual turning away, failure to repent when their sins were exposed, You have to bring discipline. But it wasn't because we hated our children. It's not because you hate your children. It's the opposite. It's because you love them so much. If you don't don't care about them, if if you don't love them, then you just let them have whatever they want because you don't care. So it's just the opposite. So think about this, y'all. If a pastor in this day and age, will get up in a pulpit in our America and will proclaim the truth of God's word when he knows the people are going to be upset because they don't want to hear it. You know that man loves you. But more than loving God's people, he loves God. 
And y'all, I've told you so many times, we need to pray for God's men, especially in this day of the woman. And I'm talking about this day of the woman in the church. Because a lot of men are just backing down, letting Eve have whatever she wants. But here in Israel's history, God sends Isaiah to warn his people of his judgment. And he's, it's, he's just so honest about the sin of his people, but he's also very gracious. Now, God begins chapter 1, and this is what you want to write in that blank. God exposes the sin of his people. He's exposing the sin, the utter rebellion of his people. They have been told over and over and over and over how God chose them and wants to bless them through their obedience, but they don't care. They've just turned away. And so God issues a hard indictment on those he loves. So the, in that first chapter, he's exposing the sin, even telling them the results of their sin. And he goes on to say that he's outraged at their callousness, outraged that they will still go to church, they will still offer their praise, and they will engage in religion, but he calls it worthless. He's had enough. He's weary of it. Then he goes on and describes them more fully in chapter 2. And that's where you can write, a day of reckoning is coming. It's here that God declares and affirms his reign, that a day of reckoning will come. And God affirms this. And this chapter is interspersed with pleading for his people. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. He wants them to b brought back into the, a right relationship. So in Isaiah chapters 1 and 2, God has affirmed in broad terms that ju the judgment will come. And he gives examples of the people's sin. He even pleaded with them to reason with him. He told them that though their sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. But here we are camping in chapter 3. God reveals how we can recognize that, he, that we are being judged by him. And it's such a sobering passage of scripture. But there are frightening parallels for the day in which we live. Chapter 3, we see vivid pictures of God's judgment. And you might want to write in your blank there, signs of God's judgment. God doesn't just say he will judge in broad terms. Here he gets very specific. So what you see in verse 1 is that God removes sustenance. The chapter begins this way. For behold, the Lord God of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. So that's the first sign of God's judgment, what's happening to the food and the water. Second, God removes good men from leadership. Verses 2 and 3. The mighty man and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the honorable man, the counselor and the expert artisan, and the skillful enchanter. Oh my, just think about that for a second. Where we are, how we suffer when good men no longer lead. I mean, look what he says there. The mighty man, the warrior. Think about this in terms of the defender and a protector. The judge who executes judge, who brings justice. And the prophet, the one who foretells. The captain of 50. And then he says, the honorable man. Those are going to be gone from leadership. Sign of God's judgment. Verse 4. Children rule. And I will make mere lads their princes. I will make mere lads their princes. And capricious children will rule over them. Children will rule. Now, think about this for a second in terms of where we are. We're kind of afraid of our children, afraid of our youth. I mean, we're, that, uh, that fear comes up in lots of ways. Oh, we're afraid we're going to damage them. We're afraid we're going to, even when we know what's right, we're afraid this is going to harm them forever. We're afraid to tell our teenager no. We're afraid of our children. And of course, since the rise of the youth culture, parents are afraid they can't relate. I can't relate. I want to relate to my child. They want to be their child's friend. They're afraid. Parents are afraid to give their children rules. You know, a number of years ago, there was a cover story in Time magazine. It was when my children were young, and the, the, they asked this question, do kids have too much power? I mean, that was a long time ago when my children were growing up. And, of course, the article described materialism, and this was the, for the 90s children. 
everything handed to them on a silver platter. And as you all know, it's only grown since then. It's only been more snowballed since then. And, of course, parents today either abandon their children, acting like they are great big burdens to endure or, they de or to, to destroy. Or the other end of the spectrum is to act like the universe revolves around them and you have child-centered parenting. So in our materialism where things are more important than the life lessons, we, we end up giving our children everything just to kind of keep them out of our hair. And somehow we think we're good parents because of this. Children ruling over their parents and over society is a sign of God's judgment. You know, it's supposed to be the older people who gained wisdom and experience, honorable adults who are leading. So when children take over, again, these are signs of God's judgment. You see what we have so far? Affects the food and water. Good men are gone from leadership. Children rule. And then in verse 5, and the people will be oppressed, each one by another and each one by his neighbor. The youth will storm against the elder and the inferior against the honorable. I mean, this is the day and age of lawsuits. Youth storm. Think about this, just youth storming against elder. Every time you read a news article, hear of a news, a news story about youth storming against their parents, going against older people, disrespecting older people. You just think about Isaiah. Verse 6, when a man lays hold of his brother in his father's house saying, you have a cloak, you shall be our ruler, and these ruins will be under your charge. You see what's happening there? It's just anyone will rule. Anyone can be in charge. He lays hold of his brother in his father's house saying, you have a cloak. You need to be our ruler. You know, and all these ruins, they're going to be under your charge. You be in charge. On that day, will he protest saying, I will not be your healer. For in my house, there is neither bread nor cloak. You should not appoint me ruler of the people. So it's, what God is telling us is that inexperienced boys and children would be unable to stop oppression and conflict. Anybody who could be grabbed would be placed in charge of the people. His only qualification, according to this verse, would be a cloak. I mean, you think about some of the people that have been elected in our nation. The foolishness of what they say and what they do. Good people not running the country anymore. Honorable people. And, of course, these types of leaders have no solutions for the problems of our land. They just want to be in charge. Verse 8. And this is where we see rebellion in speech and actions against the Lord. Just listen to this. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech and their actions are against the Lord to rebel against his glorious presence. The expression of their faces bears witness against them and they display their sin like Sodom. They do not even conceal it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. Say to the righteous that it will go well with them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. But woe to the wicked, it will go badly with him, for what he deserves will be done to him. I mean, you just look at verse 9, and you just think about the day we live in. The expression of their faces bears witness against them, and they display their sin like Sodom. They don't even conceal it. They're not, there's no more shame for anything anymore. I mean, you just talk and... <laughs> You be with millennials for any length of time, and there's no right and wrong. And everything, have you noticed that new phrase is like, this is my truth, this is your truth, this is her truth. Y'all, there's just truth. It's not my truth, unless my truth is God's truth. It's like, and then the next thing, verse 12 says, Oh, my people, their oppressors are children. So again, here's the theme of children. Children ruling, children oppressing. And then the next thing says, And women rule over them. Oh, my people, those who guide you, lead you astray and confuse the direction of your paths. Y'all, let me just tell you something here. Women ruling, the future being female, or today being female, and that, what that carries with it is women are in charge. We are in charge. And of course, we already have so much power. We do. We wouldn't even be in this place if we didn't. But y'all, women ruling is not a sign of progress. 
it's a sign of God's judgment. And I don't want to be misunderstood, so please hear me. I want to make some comments. Please hear me. Please don't take anything I say and take it somewhere that I didn't take it. I believe, and the Bible teaches in the, the equality of men and women, God's word, God's truth teaches this. I believe, and God's word teaches this, in the co-rulership of man and woman. That's what we see right in the Garden of Eden. But the Bible also teaches different roles for men and women. And differing roles is not about one being inferior or better. Different is not a dirty word. And the feminism that we've seen in these last decades and what we're seeing today is, hasn't been about, nor has it ever been about, I don't think, about fairness, equality, opportunity, and respect for all women. It's about the political agenda of a selective diversity. And y'all know this. You know this. If you're a thinking woman, and I believe you are, you already know this. But in reality, it's really anti-female. It's anti-family, and it certainly is anti-children. If you just take a little visit to NAL's website, you'll find what they care about. Abortion, ruling over men, fighting believers, fighting Christians, being against believers. I mean, you just look at what's happening to our, our uh, vice president's wife and how she's being attacked. You will find that it's all about LGBTQ+. You know, I was born toward the end of the baby boom generation. And in my coming of age years, women born into middle class families were expected to get a college education and expected to embrace feminist ideals. Women of my generation, and especially those 10 to 20 years before me, bought the feminist package. Y'all, we didn't have to get married, have kids, much less be a worker at home. We could be anything we wanted to be. We could have our own careers, and besides all that, we could be sexually free. So armed with our birth control pills and a no-restraint philosophy, we could do whatever we wanted. And y'all, we've so progressed. The calls for freedom and gender equality was really cries for just no rules, no, just licentiousness, just, you know, free, like the hippie generation, just casual sexual relationships, experimentation and celebration of homosexuality and bisexuality. And abortion could be used as birth control. And all of that's viewed as a woman's right, claiming fluidity, and y'all, I can't even keep up with all the new terms we are supposed to use and embrace and celebrate. But God warns us in his word that these behaviors bring a lifetime of emptiness. They bring a lifetime of regret and confusion. And if, even if in this day a lot of these people these can, can mask all that, it's going to bring it in the eternal judgment and even though it brings the possibility of barrenness, the loss of intimacy on that soul level, and exposure to a whole host of acute and chronic diseases. I mean, God warns all of, about all of this. Y'all, when my children were still in the home, there were all sorts of books being published for young girls coming of age. And y'all, now that I have grandchildren, there's just, it's, just, it's just exponential. And, of course, they were packaged as friends, giving girls advice and education about growing up. And in the back, there were helpful resources, helpful resources. I mean, here's just a few of them that I took note of when my daughter was growing up. Parents, families, and friends of lesbian and gays, Planned Parenthood, National Youth Advocacy. These are the helpful resources. Coalition, which focuses solely on improving the lives of gay and lesbians, bisexual and transgender youth through advocacy, education, and dissemination of information. And the suggested reading were things like this. Free Your Mind, the book for gay, lesbian, and bisexual youth and their allies, outspoken role models from lesbian and gay community. My Body, Myself, Dr. Ruth talks to kids. Is it a choice? It's a girl thing. How to stay healthy, safe, and in charge. Y'all, this is women ruling. Women have been ruling for a long time. We have the power. 
And we've been using that power in so many destructive ways. When my daughter was young, again, there was a, we were in a scrapbooking store. A scrapbooking store. And we picked up some beautiful stickers by an artist, and her name was Susan Branch. And I still have them. I saved them. Aren't they pretty? But here's what they say. Girl power, girls rule. I've I've written them here because it's kind of hard to read those, but this is what it says. I'm as pure as the driven slush. Men, schmen, shebop. I don't know what that means. I didn't know what it meant then. I don't know what it means now. (laughs) Going on a manhunt. You know, you think about that, men, schmen, but going on a manhunt. A beautiful woman with a vacant mind is only good for frightening fish when she falls into the water. Even cowgirls get the blues. She, with in all caps, she who must be obeyed. Girls are just smarter. Let me not be sad because I am born a woman in this world. Many saints suffer in this way. Chicks rock. You go, girl. Isn't that pretty? We didn't make a scrapbook with those, by the way. <laughs> Y'all, this is not funny, though. I mean, I, I, you kind of want to laugh at it, but it's not funny because, I mean, this is when my daughter was growing up. Another time when she and I were shopping for body lotion. In fact, we were shopping for this because we were putting together boxes to send to uh, some of our missionary women in uh, other countries. And that was one of the things that they needed and wanted was body lotion. And we came upon a brand that was beautifully packaged. It was very attractive. And y'all, it's called, I mean, I couldn't put my finger on it, but something seemed funny to me about this one brand that we found. I'm not even going to give the name. I don't even know if they still make it. But they had a website targeted at young girls, all about empowering the young girls in a way that they shouldn't be empowered. And then that then that did not even talk about the novels that are out there and the books that your daughters are reading that are giving them the wrong message. And then there are all the women's programs slandering and emasculating men and those kinds of books. How are we to grow young girls today? You know what? We as his women, we just need to wake up. And we need to be the kind of leaders that God says we are to be, that he wants us to be. I don't like what feminists have done to a generation of women and children who pay the price of a lost, intact, loving, stable home with married, committed moms and dads. I'm sad to know that wonderfully bright young women are indoctrinated into women's studies programs on our university campuses that do not prepare them to be the kind of co-rulers that God says they are to be in his word. And y'all, real women, they don't divorce their husbands just because I don't love him anymore. He's not the love of my life. He doesn't look at me the way I want to be looked at. They don't just say, they don't do that. They're not unwed mothers by choice and choosing that path because they know that children need to have a mother and a father And just because sometimes in this sinful world that we live in, a father or a mother is lost due to death or or something happens, and God steps and meets that need, we don't make that the rule. We don't make a choice to bring up children that way. God steps in and cares for the orphans and the widows and the widowers. But we don't choose that. Real women don't hire full-time nannies. Or put their children in daycare facilities. 
They believe, real women believe in holy matrimony. They value men for their God-given masculinity and they respect the God who created the, the God who created them to be the men that he wants them to be. And real women rulers recognize the complementary differences between men and women. They understand that men and, men and women both bring unique giftedness, not only to their homes and in their homes, but to the world and to the church. Real women rulers prize and cherish their femininity. They value the nurturing of children. They're teaching their daughters these things. They know that the ability to bear children is a gift from God. They know that children are not burdens to bear or to, be, to, to just endure or gotten rid of or obstacles to real life or playthings to be worshipped and adored. Real women rulers want to be soft the way God wants them to be, and they value their God-given emotions, and they bring them under God's con gracious control. And it's still true that almost every woman wants more than anything else to be loved by one man who will commit himself to her only, whom she can respect and admire, with whom she can bear and raise children who will be faithful to her, and she will be faithful to him she may want other things, but they'll still pale in comparison to that. I don't care what the feminists have told us forever. All that's true unless, 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 and this is a big unless, she has rejected the one who created her. Isaiah continues in verse 13. The Lord arises to contend and stands to judge the people. And how does he do this? He tells us in verse 14, The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It is you who have it devoured the vineyard, the plunder of the poor in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. Do you see who God's holding accountable? He's holding accountable the elders and princes of his people. See, just like in the garden, God held his man accountable then for not leading the way he should. Adam should have led Eve. Instead, he let her lead him. The result, the people are crushed. That's what we're seeing. When men don't take their God-given responsibility, seriously, the people are crushed. The poor suffer. I mean, we could teach a whole discourse on the sins of men and an indictment against them. I could do that. But God has a message, y'all, for his women I mean, we could talk about men all day long, but God wants to speak to us as his women. Further results, women not only rule, but God's women are proud and seductive. Isaiah was called of God to reveal how everyone had contributed to the national guilt and how God would judge each one. And here he reproves and warns the women. He singles them out. He tells the women their faults. Now, Moses had done the same thing when he proclaimed God's wrath against, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, Moses is talking about the blessings of obedience, and then he talks about the curses for disobedience. And one of the things he said about the women, he said that this woman, this is part of the judgment, one of the curses, who wouldn't even want the sole of her foot to touch the ground because she's so delicate, that tender and delicate woman, she would start begrudging her husband that she loves and her own son and her daughter. So it's not just here in Isaiah. Isaiah tells it like it is, and God bless him for not being afraid of the women. God bless him for not thinking, I better not make the women mad. I'm sure some of them did. But others listened. Others had soft, teachable hearts, and they took God's, uh, God's prophet's words to heart. And they weren't, because here's the thing, they weren't Isaiah's words anyway. They were the words of God. Listen, verse 16, moreover, the Lord said. Now, let me say something right here. I'll stop. Because it's interesting that Isaiah reminds them right here that he's speaking for the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord said this. Because, see, women, it's easy for us as women to resent the preacher or to falsely accuse the preacher. Like, why is he looking at us? Why is he taking notice of us? And, of course, Isaiah, he's reminding them, this is what God says, y'all. God is the one who's taking notice. And, of course, you know, whether the women hear or whether they will obey was not the preacher's responsibility. It wasn't Isaiah's responsibility. But it was Isaiah's responsibility to tell them exactly what God said. 
And of course, today, y'all, God bless every preacher who's willing to speak to women directly on matters of where God has spoken to them and who will speak truthfully and not be afraid of them. Now, God speaks bluntly. His words are very chilling. He's not happy. In fact, he's angry over the sin of God's women. God had taken notice of their pride, their foolishness, their vanity, their seductiveness, and even their clothes. He tells it like it is. Verse 16, moreover, the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are proud and walk with heads held high and seductive eyes and go along with mincing steps, they tinkle and tinkle the bangles on their feet. So, you, you, I mean, it's very plain. The women are proud. They're snobby. They're seductive. With their eyes, they draw and seduce men. Seductive eyes. These women don't just walk, but they walk so that people will look at them. I mean, there's just a woman's walk. She just walks, but then there is a woman's walk. Mincing steps. Look at me. Call attention to me. Admire them. They want the admiration. That's, that's what it means. They go along with mincing steps. Look at me. Now, remember, these are the daughters of Zion. What that means is these are God's women. To, to use New Testament language, these are the Christian women, the church girls, the ones who claim to know the Lord. And God is announcing his judgment on his women in the next verses. And what we see here in verse 17, Therefore the Lord will afflict the scalp of the daughters of Zion with scabs. Isn't that awful? And the Lord will make their foreheads bare. In that day, the Lord will take away the beauty of their anklets, headbands, crescent ornaments, dangling earrings, bracelets, veils, headdresses, ankle chains, sashes, perfume boxes, amulets, finger rings, nose rings, festal robes, outer tunics, cloaks, money purses, hand mirrors, undergarments, turbans, and veils. Well, at least he didn't mention necklaces. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's no accident that Isaiah talks about all this stuff, ladies. He's pointing out how vain these women are. That's what he's doing. He gives this long list and all the ways they're dolling themselves up. I mean, look at that list. Now it will come about that instead of sweet perfume, there will be putrefaction. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of a, a well-set hair, plucked out scalp. Instead of fine clothes, a donning of sackcloth and branding instead of beauty. So you see what you see in those verses. He removes her beauty. That's what happens in judgment. And then he brings shame and humiliation. Verse 25, your men will fall by the sword and your mighty ones in battle. And her gates will lament and mourn and deserted she will sit on the ground. And of course, y'all, isn't this the picture of our day of women being deserted left and right? Our men falling by the sword. I mean, here God's talking about how we lose our men in battle and war. This is God's judgment as well. And the way women live on the home front affects the men in combat. But we're not in the middle. Sometimes we're not in the middle of a real war. But we're losing our men. They're falling. We're losing our good men. Because not only is there real war and the real military fighting, there's also another kind of war, a war for the hearts and souls of women. The very women the men are, are supposed to protect are the reason so many men are deserting them. This, in this mass abandonment of women from the home, this desertion of women from the home leaving their post, who did they leave behind? They didn't just leave behind their daughters. They left behind their sons, sons who would grow up to be men, sons and daughters needing to be trained and equipped. Have you ever thought about the way that you nurture and train your son? And I know we talked about this all in the fall. The way you protect and love him in his growing up years has a direct effect on his leadership and his dealings with women in his later years. I mean, this is the truth of Scripture, and, of course, we've had women deserting their children in record numbers in the last 40, 50, 60 years. Is it no wonder that we have men deserting their children and women in this day in record numbers? He just gets up and leaves. He finds some other attractive lady, and he's gone. And I know men have their own sins, but God's speaking to us. 
This is part of the judgment of God, y'all. He takes away our men. When women go bad, when they turn to immorality, they are deserted. And it's so bad in that day. In chapter 4, verse 1, he says, For seven women will take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. The women are so desperate, they'll do anything to get a man. They don't even care how many other women he's had. They're begging. I mean, that's what they're saying, like, we don't care. We'll do everything for ourselves. Just let us have your name. Just we don't want to be reproached. God's saying that when women go bad with all their immorality, with all their sexual sin, with their excessive ador adornment, with their vanity, with their building shrines to themselves, the worshiping of herself, it's reflected in the lack of good men. A woman's immorality has a direct effect on our men. Y'all, we know this is true. I mean, all that push for sexual freedom of women, where women just become just like, you know, partner after partner after partner, it's destroyed our men. There's nobody to provide and protect for anymore. There's no respect for women anymore because men like to, to, to earn the respect of a woman. Men like to, to pursue a woman, something worth having. A, but women are like, no, I don't care. You can just have me. I don't care. And God's judgment here is that not only does God take away beauty, not only does he bring shame and humiliation, but he takes away the men. Now... We're out of time today. We're not finished with chapter 3. And when we come back next time, not only are we going to finish with chapter 3 and go into chapter 4, unless we don't finish next time, then we'll go to, to the third session. But we'll also go and hear from Ezekiel and what he says. Y'all, this is not just isolated here in Isaiah. This is all throughout the Word. I mean, you've already heard me talk about Deuteronomy. You heard me talk about Genesis. I mean, this is, this is when, you, when you study the Bible seriously, you see. If you belong to Christ and you say, open my eyes, I may behold wonderful things from your law. It's just like God takes the blinders off and you see our culture for what it really is. Instead of just sitting at home at night and flicking on the TV and laughing at programs and movies that display its sin like Sodom. Don't even conceal it. And displaying it right before our children's eyes. And y'all, make no mistake, this is filtering into the children's programs. You can't just trust whatever children's program is out there. You got to be discerning. You got to look it up. You got to read about it. You got to know. Because there's plenty, there, there is, there are plenty of good things for your children to watch and to be exposed to and to read. We're able to get to all of that. And especially as you're training your daughters, but I hope you picked up, even with today, that as I was raising my daughter, the times when God just brought it before my eyes, this is where the culture is. And he'll do it in everyday things like packing, packing missionary boxes to send the missionaries overseas. And then if you, have, if you have a heart that beats for God, God, things jump out at you. And you don't have to become fearful and scared and reactionary. You just say, oh, this, oh, this, is, this is what God says will happen. But God is faithful to every generation. And he's faithful. He's faithful to my daughter. He'll be faithful to my granddaughters. And he'll be faithful to yours and he'll be faithful to you. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. And he's, even as we've walked through this today, and I know that as women have been listening and hearing, this is just your word. But I also know that there may be women who are listening and hearing who don't know you as their Savior. Father, I'm so thankful that you didn't leave us just to go our own wicked way. The word, your word tells us that all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. In fact, that is in Isaiah. But you sent a Savior. You sent the God-man Jesus Christ, who was the perfect man. He was fully God, yet fully man. And he came to this earth as a baby through a woman's womb who nurtured and raised him. This sinful woman nurtured and raised the Savior who would grow up to be not only the Savior for the world and die for my sins, but died for his own mother's sins. Father, we thank you that he drank the bitter cup of all of the wickedness that has ever been committed and all that will ever be committed. And he drank that cup and he went to the cross and he took it in his body on the tree. And he suffered 
and died the death that I should suffer and die. And then he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, proving that he was God and proving that he has victory over sin and death. And because he did that and because he lives today and because I have placed my faith and trust and hope in him, then I have new life. And you've taken the blinders off my eyes. And I pray that you are, the blinders are dropping off of all kinds of women's eyes today who see things, maybe they see the cross for the first time in living color and they realize that they're a sinner and they need a savior. So I pray you would save that woman. And when you save a woman, then she has such an influence on her husband and her children. And a whole home is changed. And Father, I pray for women who are already believers that maybe, some, maybe they've been blinded by the culture because they've just been drifting, as one lady told me on Sunday. I didn't even realize how far I was getting away from the Scripture. In just some lukewarm church that's telling her pretty things. But then she said, I don't want to hear pretty things. I want to hear the truth. So, Father, I pray we would have those, that kind of heart. Father, I pray for every young woman. I pray for the young girls who are in here today who are just barely teenagers. I thank you for their encouragement. Father, I thank you that they're here, that as I grow into a much older woman, that I know that because you always raise up remnants, that they will carry on if you haven't returned long after I'm dead and gone in my generation. So I thank you for them, and I thank you again, too, for all the little boys and girls who are growing up in homes where Mama loves you, and she's taking your word seriously. In Jesus' name, amen.